Amen. So great to see you uh, this morning. And wow, how the choir, Stephen, everyone, the orchestra has guided us. You've heard the theme, just to rest in him. Before I dive into the message here, uh, you can go ahead and turn if you want to to Hebrews 4. You probably know we're going to be in Hebrews unless you're new today. I've met some who are new today, but um, grab your Bible. I want everybody to have a Bible in front of you. As, as you're turning there, and before I, I hearken into this, dive into this uh, message, I want to pause for a moment. Um, in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 12, it says to honor those who, who serve among you. Honor those who lead. And we seek to do that as a church family. Every now and then we'll see today. It's good to pause. Every now and then it's good to stop and remember how good God is to us and what he's done instead of just pressing on and keep on pressing on. And I hope you do that in your family and your own personal life. You're going to hear about that today, how we need to do that regularly. But today we pause to remember and to celebrate um, the life and ministry of one among us. Dr. Jack Martin has been on our staff for 25 years. Yeah, he doesn't know. He didn't know we're gonna do this. Um, 1998, if you do the math. Jack and I met each other at that time, and I was here for about a year, and then many of you know the Lord called me to First McKinney for a while, and after coming out of the wilderness, uh, the Lord brought me back um, <laughs> to the promised land and with Jack again. Jack has been a, a friend, a mentor in many ways. He's been a confidant. He's been a co-worker, a co-laborer. He's been a source of great comfort in my life and wisdom and encouragement. And I'm so thankful, Jack, for your life as you have served here so faithfully as the minister of pastoral care. I'm curious. And now I'm going to do this. Again, he didn't know we were going to do this. Jack, I'm going to ask you to stand. Would you do that? Would you just stand for just a moment? And I want to ask you, church family, if you have received a phone call, um, maybe a text, maybe a moment, maybe a home visit, or he's come to, to visit you in the hospital, or perhaps he's done a family member's funeral. If that describes you, would you just raise your hand? Would you just, <laughs> Jack, I want you to look around. I want you to look around. Because the Lord has has used you in the lives of so many of us. And we praise him for you. Thank you for being faithful. Jack, um, you might say, well, what can we do for him? What can we do? Well, through your giving, uh, as is our practice, uh, at 25 years, he's received a generous gift from our church family. And so as Rodney has noted, um, don't give him any more money. Give it to the unified budget <laughs> would help a lot. So do that this week. Uh, no kidding, because this is the week, gang. Rodney, Rodney is kind, but this is the week we're closing out the financial year. And if you could, I'm asking some of you who can to give this week. And it's going to take all of us. But if we can, if we can bridge the gap between this deficit, then we can plan. If not, we're going to have a hard time planning over the next six months to be so far back. And uh, we believe that we can do it. And so I want to challenge you to do so. Um, Jack, Rodney and I were talking earlier and we, we did the math. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing you would never have done this, but we don't know exactly. Um, but gosh, over 25 years, you've done conservatively, you've done over a thousand funeral services, uh, services of remembrance. And, and I know that coming alongside you and many of those, that, that means a few, a few meetings prior to and phone calls and lots of visits. So we are so thankful for you and praise God for you. Hey, may we join him in serving one another, right? But it, it's, it's true. We, we have pastors, shepherds among us, but all of us are called to serve one another. That's why we are such an amazing church family, not because of leaders or Jack or shepherds among you, but because of you and how we serve each other through our connect groups. 
So let's, uh, let's dive in. From the cradle to the grave, we are here to serve one another. I've been reminded uh, lately, when you think about the cradle, uh, that new parents of newborns don't get a lot of sleep. Um, now, Stacy and I, we, we don't have a newborn around, but you know that we are new grandparents, relatively. We have one who's one year old, and we have one who's just, gosh, I don't know, 10 weeks, maybe. But we've watched again, as we've seen our own kids, uh, lose a little bit of sleep. And most of you know, we started with twins. So they did what I call tag team sleeping, right? If you've ever watched, the, you know, some wrestling, wrestling on television, um, you know, they tag one and the other goes in, my time to rest. And that's what would happen. One sister would sleep and now, hey, you, now, now you wake up, I'm going to sleep. And so a nursing mom in particular and a dad is not going to get a whole lot of sleep. Well, I Googled this, curious, newborns sleep up to 19 hours a day. What's the deal? Well, life goes on, and every young parent knows what the deal is. Just when you want to rest, the newborn wakes up. And now you've got this screaming, unavoidable demand, right, for your undivided attention. But it's not only new parents who are longing for rest and then whose lives are interrupted with a screaming, unavoidable need. I'm guessing, and Jack and I have talked about this, I've said this before from the pulpit, the thing that I pray over people more than anything else, in various words, different iterations of it, but the thing we pray for most is peace. The thing we pray for over our people is peace. Why? Because we all need peace. Isn't that what you need today? We're talking about rest, and we're talking today about soulful gospel rest. Because we all know this. There's a reason that we cannot stop. And, and, and the reason is within us. It starts in the heart. And you don't have to just be physically busy in your day or rushing from here to there to have your mind mentally racing, always running, never arriving. Are you living your way, your life that way these days? Always running, never arriving. We, all need, we know we need physical rest to live. It's why sleep deprivation is a form of torture. We can't live that way. And so the Lord calls us to stop. He calls us to slow down. And what you're going to learn today, in part, uh, is how, how do you find this soul for rest? How do you rest? By resting. How, how, how do you enter into the soul for rest? By resting physically. You see, we're holistic people, right? Our bodies rest, need rest. Our minds, our souls, hearts need rest. And in Hebrews chapter 4, we're going to see in this passage that rest comes from remembering may sound strange a bit early on here. We'll explain. It leads to rejoicing. And it allows for reflecting. If you take notes in your bulletin, notes on sermons, you can track with me there. Rest comes from remembering. Now, again, this is where we find another therefore in verse 1. Ties us back to chapter 3. We're not going to read this portion that we now have jumped to, jumped over. But we read it before in our 12 reading plan. I'm going to read this passage tomorrow, by the way, because we've been reading in Exodus because you're going to see, like the Hebrews, these Jewish Christians, they're tracking with him completely. We have to pause. That's why it's tough to preach Hebrews. We've got to go, okay, let's, let's pause for a minute. Here's what he's talking about. Oh, yeah, let's stop again. Here's what he's talking about. You're going to see this throughout this passage. But the Hebrews are like, uh, with you, with you, with you. Got this. It's why we've said that the 12 reading plan is so critical. Not just in our lives to be dwelling in him, abiding in him, but to be on the same page as a church family. He's hearkening back to their collective memory that a lot of us have now adopted of the people of Israel out of Exodus, gosh, through the wandering of the wilderness. And he's reminding them that a lack of faith is actually the result of, listen to this language, an evil, unbelieving heart. Seems like strong language for just, well, no, I just don't believe like I should. 
The leaf is driven by what he calls this devastating result of a hardening of the heart and deceitfulness of sin. Unbelief is not a small thing before God who says, trust me. So he's drawing from Exodus. He's drawing from Psalm 95 is another place. But look at this. Here we go. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news, literally gospel, same word that we use, Good news came to us just as to them. So good news came to them. He's hearkening back again to the people of God in the wilderness. But the message they heard did not benefit them. They heard good news, but it didn't benefit them because they were not united by faith, operative phrase, with those who listened. That is to say, those who did receive it. Those who did believe, they weren't united, the ones who didn't receive it. Now, it's important in this passage, real quick, to understand, he's talking about three types of rest. Primarily here, to, in this passage, he's going to be talking about future rest, a future rest to come. But here he's talking about a past rest, right, of the people of God. He's using the analogy, future rest, and, and then how we can experience this present rest, the current rest. So the past rest is talked about in chapter 3. People uh, called to enter into the promised land. That you remember the story. Again, the Hebrews are tracking with him here. It, they, 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 well, there were giants in the land. They were scared. They were afraid. They knew that God had promised them the land, but they didn't go in. Disbelief kept them a lack of faith, and God vowed they would never enter it. That's what happens when we do not believe. Why is it that you cannot stop? Why are you always running, never arriving? Because you're not remembering what God has done in your life. If you are a believer, you have forgotten that you've been justified already. Not through your words, not through all your efforts, not trying to please everyone around you or accomplish all of these things. Why can you not stop? Why are you anxious? Because you have forgotten who you are, which is why all of the Christian life I had a conversation with a young, one of our young adults this week, all, all the Christian life is remaining in him. And I told this young man, 20 something, I said, you know, you probably think as your pastor, older man, I've arrived. I may just stay here all the time. I'm just at peace at rest all the time. And I said, you know, that's, that's really not the case, but you know what I know? That is the battle of the Christian life. That's my focus. Lord, remind me again of how much you love me. Remind me that I'm covered in your righteousness. I am fully forgiven, totally loved by you. That's who I am. Nothing that's said, nothing I do or do not do today is the truest thing about me. The truest thing about me is that I am loved by him. This is the Christian life, friends. To remain in him, not that you'll lose your salvation, but because you have it. You, you don't achieve it. You've received it. That's where rest begins. It's why you can't stop. It's why your mind can't stop. There's a past rest he's pointing to that, that results in this present rest. But look at this. There's a future rest. And this is the one that, look at this. This is the rest that still stands. The future rest that's to come. Because not everyone in a crowd this size, not everyone perhaps, has received this rest that comes only through salvation by faith. You will never stop running until you find your rest in Him. And this comes when we believe by faith. So this future rest is an eternal rest of the new heaven and the new earth for all eternity that Christ will, be, will, will remake, redeem all things when He comes again. And between the past and the future, there's a current rest that we can live in. Jesus brings a better rest. Look at verse 3. For we who have believed enter that rest. Okay, watch this. Salvation. The rest that comes. No longer having to justify ourselves. We've been justified by Christ and His finished work on the cross. And He has said, as I swore in my wrath... Now watch this. This is God's holy reaction to sin. Disbelief has consequences. 
that I could argue are already set in motion. Disbelief is met by the wrath of God. This is why if you do not know Him, if you're not in Him, covered in His righteousness, the God of, the God of love is, yes, the God of wrath, and you will face the consequences of not being, not being covered in His righteousness, out here on your own, exposed by your own self-righteousness. You see, His rest comes for those who have received. This is this eternal rest to come. And as I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. He's saying God did his part before the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day. Now look at all these converging analogies. Again, the Hebrews are going, we're with you, we're with you. And somewhere he's spoken seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his work. That's Genesis 2.2. So we know now he's hearkening back to wait. This is when, when uh, the Sabbath was established. God rested, but don't miss this. God didn't rest because he was tired. God rested, as we'll see, because he wanted to look and see. He paused to rejoice in what he had created. It's all very good. And so he's combining all of these three aspects. Rest of the past, the future, the present. Now that we can experience because of what Christ has done. He brings this fourth analogy in this creation. So God establishes rest. And then it's, look at this. It's then implemented in the law in Exodus 20. It becomes law. Again, how about that? There's a reason God says, this is one of the Ten Commandments. Stop. Stop. It's that for, about what, Psalm 46, verse 10. Cease striving. Why? And know that I'm God. Stop. Some of you, some of the, 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 the holiest thing you can do today is to go home and take a nap. Can I get an amen? amen. Tuesday afternoon, the holiest thing you might do is step away from it all and remember. How much he loves you. You see, there's a way to live in this Sabbath rest. Exodus 20, it, it's instituted in the law. And then Jesus comes. He says, that's the Sabbath that was made for man, made for us. And then Jesus says in Mark 20, 27, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Meaning I have authority over it all. I can, he's speaking to Pharisees saying, I'll, I'll determine how to institute this Sabbath. Because there's a Sabbath rest that's way beyond one day. Way beyond a command in Scripture, it is found in me. I am the Lord of the Sabbath. All of this, I'm saying all this to, because he's making the point. This is the point. Whether it's past rest he's talking about, future rest to come, current rest that he now experience, is all entered into by faith. It's trusting in the promise of the finished work of what Christ has already done. Look at verse 5. And again in this passage he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains, okay, look at this, not yet fulfilled for some to enter it. And those who formerly, okay, earlier ones, received the good news, failed to enter because of disobedience. Again, he appoints a certain day. Look at this. He has set a date on the calendar for this rest. He set a date on the calendar for this rest for you. What's the date? Today. Today is the day. Today is the day. Today is the day of salvation. Today, saying through David, oh, now he's bringing David in so long afterward in the words already quoted. So now he's just noting Psalm 95. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And friends, I'm pleading with all of us. If you do not know the Lord Jesus, I'm pleading with you. Do not harden your heart. And don't simply, well, yeah, I just struggle with belief. I'm just struggling. I get that. Friend, there comes a point when you have to step in by faith and say, I can, I, I'm tired of trying to justify myself. I'm tired of being good enough. I can't, I can't rest. And even when I do rest, my mind cannot stop. I'm anxious, friend. You will never find rest until you find it in Jesus. And today is the day of salvation for you. To say yes to him. 
What he's doing here, bringing David in the mix, we've got all of these, and he's about to bring Joshua in. So he's not done yet. But what he's doing is he's saying the entire Bible is connected and it all points to Jesus. We say this often. Today, we will remember. And friends, I just want to affirm you for being here in worship on this day, the Lord's day. And I challenge you, whatever you've got going on, if you're in town, to be here next week. Why is that? Because every day we gather on Sunday, not only are we obeying, I believe, a command for Sabbath, but now the new day of worship, the day of resurrection, every one of our services are designed like this. Remember, let's just sing about the gospel and be reminded of what he's done for us. Let's rejoice in what he's done. Let's just celebrate his grace together. And you're in the moment. You saw it earlier. And while we're singing, you're like, I'm not alone. I'm not alone. Maybe I don't feel like singing today. I'm tired. I'm weary. But there's somebody down the pew here. next. There's somebody singing right here, though. And I'm feeling it. I want to sing. I want to sing even in the dark nights of the soul. We sing about it early. I want to sing even as the storm rages. That's why we come together. Remember, rejoice, and to reflect on what he has done together. And that's what we're now doing. So why is it that my mind is always racing? He tells us why. You've rejected the promise. And for those of you who've never received Christ, you've never uh, entered into that salvation relationship with him, believing by faith that he died on the cross for your sin. That you're now forgiven. You receive that by faith and you determine to live in it. You've rejected the promise, which is why you are experiencing fear over faith, disbelief over trusting in the promises of God. But it's not only those who are lost that can drift We'll talk about that in a moment. Because like them, the people of Israel, we have, they have 24-7 reminder of God's presence. You read about it this week. The pillar, uh, you know, the fire, the cloud that, that, that they followed all the time. They had the presence of God among them. They saw many miracles. We have the same. We have the word of God. We have each other. We have the church. We have the spirit constantly guiding us in us so we don't have to work or enter into our own self-justification. So here's the question. Pause for a moment. What marks your life? And God knows. What marks your life? Peace? A non-anxious presence? Constantly, Lord, remind me again of how much you love me all. I rejoice in your grace. Yes, that's who I am. Wow, I can love others for free because all the love I need I've found in you. What marks your life? It, or, or, or honestly, is it anxiety? Is it, is it worry? Is it constant dis-ease? Unrest? Let that convict you because the reason is that you have forgotten and you need to constantly go back. Are you doing so? Are you abiding in him? Are you in his word? Are you? And if not, again, as a church family, I just challenge you to join us tomorrow morning. We'll be reading Hebrews four and we've been reading in Exodus and we're going to go along with our scriptures and you can come to this time prepared and listening, always hearing from the Word of God every single day. And that'll remind you, again, that your identity is not achieved, it's, it's received. So remember, resting leads to remembering. But watch this, resting leads to rejoicing. That, that's, that's what follows. You know, we often think of Sabbath as rest, and it is that. But Sabbath was a day of rejoicing and celebrate. There's a whole year of Jubilee of celebrating God's faithfulness. In fact, early Christians, we say this at Easter time when we're fasting, Sunday was a day of feasting and celebration. To say, yes, he is so good to us. Resting leads to rejoicing. Look at verse eight. Now he brings Joshua into the mix. 
Again, just showing us it all points to Jesus. If Joshua had given them rest, remember Moses, not right, didn't lead them into the promised land. Joshua did. So if he had led them into the promised land, then was it a cruel joke? God was leading them there. They're going to find rest from their wandering in the wilderness. And God would not have spoken of another day later on. He's saying, Joshua didn't bring rest. Watch this. These Hebrews are tracking with him, following their history, knowing it so well. And then he says, Yeshua did not bring. Bring the, bring the freedom, finally. Yeshua, you know this, in Greek is Jesus. Yeshua was the name of Jesus. Jesus is the better Joshua. He's saying Joshua didn't do it, but this new and better Joshua does bring rest. Look at verse 9. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. There remains a Sabbath. For whoever has entered God's rest is also rested from his works as God did from his. God rested his work, yes, in creation. But watch this. Jesus dies on the cross. His final words, it is finished. It's been said that Buddha gathered with his disciples as he was dying. And his last words were never cease striving. Jesus' last words were, it is finished. Rest. There is a Sabbath that remains. And for those of us who have received it, I want to challenge you with this. He's talking about a rest that, yes, we can experience it now, but it's because primarily we know that ultimate and eternal rest is coming. This week, like every week, Jack can testify, we lose members of our church every week. And this week, we lost two great ones in Neil Davidson. Singing in our choir, you know the Davidson family, many of you. Always smiling. Love Neil Davidson. We lost Dr. Russell Dill Day this week. And there's much I could say about uh, his impact on my life. He was the president of the seminary when I got here from Charlotte, North Carolina. At the time, Southwestern Seminary was the largest seminary in the world. And if you knew anybody who was awesome in Baptist work, they went Southwestern, or so I thought, and people who impacted my life, and I ended up there. Dr. Dilday was a statesman. He was a man of grace. And even in the face of injustice, he stood strong and loving and faithful. But I reference these two men, and by the way, his service will be the 8th of July. It's a Saturday, not next, but the next. I mention them because, friend, for all of it, our day's coming. Your day's coming. Your day's coming. And, and most of us, we won't do much, you know, that's great that we'll be remembered, present in the seminary or, or whatever else, but you know what we can do? We can trust in the Lord today and live in the freedom that He's given us. That's what He's called us to do. That's success, faithfulness to his promises and to live in his promises. But, but I want to offer this analogy. Many of you know we celebrated Juneteenth on Monday. This, and it wasn't, you know that it's not the signing, it's not a celebration of the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. You know the story. Um, January 1st, 1863. But Juneteenth actually celebrates the the actual implementation of the reality. For those slaves in the remotest part of the Confederacy, Texas, and Galveston in particular, the last to hear a year and a half later that they were actually free. That the law had stated that they were free. And so for them it became the first Independence Day. Not 1776. For the first time, after Union soldiers finally came and said, no, no one's told you. Your masters, the slave owners, haven't told you 
that you're already slaves and now, I mean, already free from slavery and now we're here to, ce to, to celebrate that and to set you free. And, and instead, what, what it had happened at that time, of course, is a year and a half later, they didn't know. They didn't know that they'd been set. Can you imagine being a slave all your life and then being set free? Announce that you are free to go. Friend, we have the opportunity to declare that kind of freedom to people today. Who do you know in your life who does not know? They're in bondage. And you might be thinking some people, maybe their family, in your family, co-workers or friends or people you go to school with, you might, you might be thinking, they don't seem like they're in slavery. Oh, they are. And we have the opportunity through the gospel that brings freedom to set them free. And they too can have, for the first time ever in their lives, an Independence Day that sets them free. I share all of this because, friends, freedom has come. Now, here's the other part of this analogy. You can know that good news has come. I could argue you could even receive it and not live in it. Many of us here today, how about all of us, we're prone to go back to the law back to our own self-salvation program and it's why we cannot rest when we've already been set free it's why paul says in galatians 3 you're trying to let moses finish what christ has begun how ridiculous is that because you receive salvation he says not by works but by faith so continue on in faith which means constantly going back to the promise that he's given to you. I want to ask you, are you living as if you're still in slavery? Because you have power over sin in your life. You see, resting results or comes from remembering. And, and, and resting leads to rejoicing. And finally, we'll close with this. Resting allows for reflecting. And this is what we do when we rest. This is a lost art in our culture. Just stop. Get away from your screens. Get away from the news. Get away from the noise and just stop. How, how do you experience peace like that? I'm talking about physical, mental rest. What do you do? Again, a lot of us say, well, I go on a vacation. I can't wait. I was talking to a young adult, one of our young dads, and he said, I was, I was saying, how, how was your vacation last week? And because I just wanted to vicariously live through his vacation and, and to the beach. And he said, oh, he had three little girls. We don't go on vacations anymore. We go on trips with our family. <laughs> and, and now I need a vacation, right? You're laughing because you know what I'm talking about. You can say, well, I'm looking forward to a nap. But I, I can't wait. I, I'm, no, you know what? I'm going to be off. Like, I got a vacation coming up. It's, I mean, it's three weeks away. But I'm, that's when I'm really. Yeah, how's that working out for you, by the way? See, we can live in this rest. Wouldn't it be amazing if you could actually, do you believe it? Actually live in this gospel peace that comes. How does it happen? Look at this in verse 11. Let us therefore strive, interesting language, be earnest, diligently, eager. In fact, look at this, work. Make every effort to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience friends this is the Christian life just as we say prayer is the greater work why do you not pray as you should I'm too busy no disbelief why do you not rest disbelief to come back to his promises over and over again Lord remind me again of how much you love me remind me again of how much you love me how are we reminded he tells us look at verse 12 for the word of God is alive and active sharper than any two-edged sword piercing to the division of soul and of spirit of joints and of marrow and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart interesting segue into why we should avoid disobedience now listen to this, friends, listen. The Bible, yes, it's life-giving. Yes, it blesses us. But watch this, the Exodus story tells us that the Word of God is also capable of condemning us. It speaks truth into our soul. God's Word is alive because God is alive. 
And His Spirit is speaking to you. God's power is exercised through His Word. Are are you catching this? God's Word accomplishes what it intends to accomplish. And sometimes that is opening His Word, being totally convicted by the Holy Spirit that we must repent before God and change our lives. Or we'll never experience rest. And that's what God is calling some of us to today. A habit that you've fallen into. This is why the Word of God is, what he's describing here is a scalpel. See, a knife can kill. And some people want to use God's Word as a weapon. The Word of God is a scalpel that cuts to the heart of the matter. And if the Word is a sword, Jesus is the swordsman. He's the one who lovingly comes. And the Word of God points us to the Son of God. Look at verse 13. No creature is hidden from his sight. You can't hide from him. All of you are running. But all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. There's coming a day you will stand before a holy God and you will have either received his son as your salvation or you will be standing there exposed in your own self-righteousness and in your sin. The Word of God is like a mirror. Better, it's like an x-ray. We stay in it because it looks at the heart. My motives. Friend, if you're here today, and like many of us, you're always running, never arriving. I encourage you to pause, to slow down, and to rest in Him. We're going to just end our time together by doing so. But here's the, here's the challenge. If you've never received Christ, today is your appointed day. Today's the day. And I want you to just bow your heads and close your eyes with me. And I want to, again, for you to listen and hear the words of Jesus, not my words, his words for you today. Because you see, Yeshua, the first Joshua, said, be strong and courageous. Well, that works right up to the point when you're not strong and courageous anymore. He said, be strong and courageous because there are still battles to be fought. But Jesus, the new Yeshua, Jesus says, come to me, all who labor and heavy laden, and I will give you Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. So now in silence and for a moment, let's just come before him and just rest in him. Embrace his promises, experience his presence. And right now, just remember, rejoice, reflect, and tell him how you're going to live for him this week.